So before we get started, uh, I just want to take a second and say thank you. Um, it is an incredible honor to work and teach at this church. A major and consistent display of God's grace in my life is the grace that y'all extend to me every time I step into this pulpit. I love this Jesus that we've been talking about and Mark and being able to care for his bride in this way is deeply life-giving. So thank you. With that being said, um, I get the opportunity to start this new series uh, in our Mark study called A New Humanity. We talk about what it means to be made new by Jesus. What is Jesus trying to tell us about what it means to be human? What is he trying to show us about what it means to be human? We're going to start that series with Mark 3 and a healing story there. Mark 3, verse 1 is the story we're working on today, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. <clears throat> Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn heart, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. <clears throat> this passage is a major turning point in Mark's story of Jesus' ministry because the Pharisees are explicitly identified as Jesus' antagonist in this story. Before this moment, they were witnesses. They watched him and they asked questions. Aggressive questions, but just questions. But now they began to plot and scheme about how to destroy him. The healing recorded in Mark 3, 1 through 6 is the straw that broke the camel's back for the religious rulers. It is the event that catalyzed them to begin collecting their power and waiting for a moment to strike in order to bring down this new rabbi. So the question for us as we read verse 6 in that story is why? Why is Jesus a threat to the Pharisees and the Herodians? First of all, these groups are, are well-established institutions. They represent, represent the pinnacle of both religious and political authority in the region. Do not be deceived. This is a political group disguising itself behind religious ideas in order to collect political power. They have changed their name, but Jesus is still fighting against these same groups in America today. The Pharisees are one of the two major parties in the Jewish Sanhedrin which rules as both Congress and Supreme Court for all Jewish people. The Pharisees are actually the more powerful of the two parties at this time because one of their own is currently ruling as high priest. The Herodians, on the other hand, is just a name for anyone who supports the political aspirations of the Herod family, started by King Herod the Great. That is the same King Herod the Great who was king when Jesus was born. He was given authority to be the king of the Jews by the Roman Senate, but his, family power, his family's power lessened after his death, so that they are now a former power striving to regain their lost influence. These two groups make an odd couple, but they are unified by finding a common enemy in Jesus. So once again, we come to the question, why is he a threat to them? Why do we meet a threatening Jesus in this passage? I think the first question has to be, it's because Jesus emphasizes re relationship over efficiency. As we read through any of the Gospels, a common theme becomes the presence of these massive crowds following Jesus around, right? He feeds the 5,000. The crowd is so large that the friends have to lower the paralyzed man through the roof so that he can get to Jesus. Uh, the bleeding woman uh, is able to hide in the crowd after she touches the edge of Jesus' garment. People are intrigued. They're, they're looking for healing. People want to be near to Jesus, and they are flocking to him. And, and Jesus wants to teach. He wants to be heard. He wants to heal. But the way he goes about that, that interaction is always incredibly personal. It is a one-on-one -on -one moment between Jesus and the person being healed. They have a conversation. Oftentimes, Jesus touches the person. He calls the bleeding woman daughter. He calls the paralytic who was lowered through the roof. He calls him son. Jesus is not walking into huge crowds and waving his hands over them, healing hundreds of people at once. Theoretically, he could, right? Right? It would be an incredible demonstration of his power. It would give him credibility, and his message would spread that much faster. It would alleviate suffering for a lot of people immediately. But Jesus doesn't do it that way. That's not the stories that we're given. We're given stories like this one, where the man is pulled out of the tabernacle crowd and said to stand before Jesus, and then they have a conversation. Why does Jesus do it that way? And I think the answer has to be that Jesus wants a personal relationship with us. 
With God, it is only in the context of that relationship that healing happens. Granted, the relationships depicted in stories like this one aren't incredibly deep and complex, but they are conversations. They are the beginnings of something. They are exchanged words and shared space. They are an acknowledgement of the leper and the ostracized that most people, especially at that time, would have rather just ignored. When I was um, in early high school, my uncle called me and asked me kind of a big question. He asked me how I knew that God was real. He was struggling in his faith, and he knew that I was planning to pursue ministry after graduation, so he reached out. I really hope that 14-year-old Noah wasn't his only call that day. <laughs> but I told him, I, I don't really know how to describe it, but I have felt him. In worship, I've been overwhelmed by how close he felt. I don't have proof, I just have that experience. And that's a disappointing answer, right? It's a disappointing answer for someone who is struggling in their faith. And he seemed disappointed by it. It's not very convicting to him, at least, because it is so deeply personal. But that, that memory of that sense of God's nearness is a cornerstone of my faith. It's a refuge when I'm struggling. Just like this moment beside Jesus had to be for the man with the paralyzed hand. Or the blind man, or Zacchaeus. If I say this another way, if you were to ask me to describe my friend Jamie, I could list facts. I could talk about his job, his education, his age. I could rattle off fact after fact. But it's not until I start telling you stories that you would begin to see the nature of our friendship. It's not until I start talking about dozens of rounds of disc golf and a 2 a.m. drive to the middle of nowhere in Arkansas and fires in my backyard and him falling asleep in the stiff hospital chair next to me because it's 3 a.m. and I'm trying to pass a kidney stone. It is only when those stories are told that you actually get a picture of our connection to each other. Amen. And I think that Jesus seeks to build stories like that with his people. He doesn't ask us to rattle off facts when others ask about him. He says, tell them about the time we've spent together. Tell them that story about the boat. Tell them that story about the donkey. Tell them about that time I made you breakfast on the beach. After he heals the demon-possessed man who lives in the tombs in Gerasene, he tells him, go back to your home and tell all that God has done for you. Jesus engages in a conversation with an individual, and by the end of that chat, that individual has been healed. This is how our Jesus operates. How can you read that and still think that Jesus is not interested in relationship with you? How can we read that and still treat Jesus like a genie in a bottle? <clears throat> with all that being said, Jesus is definitely making a point here. Um, a social, political, and religious point. He has the man stand with him in the full tabernacle on Sabbath day. It is intentionally public. Jesus has one eye on the Pharisees whispering in the corner, and he asks them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do what is good or to do what is evil, to save life or to kill? And then he does the good. He, he heals the man's hand. He answers the question with his action. The story immediately preceding this one is the story of the Pharisees confronting Jesus for picking grain on the Sabbath. It may have been the same day. Jesus responds by pointing back to David eating the temple bread and says, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Amen. Jesus subverts the Pharisees' authority on that day and he emphasizes his own authority and he continues to do that here. Because the Jesus that we meet healing this man on this day, on this Sabbath day, is dismantling a broken system. He is asserting his authority. He is speaking as God. He is making it clear that he is no normal teacher, researching and pondering at the answer to tough Torah questions. He's making it clear that he is the answer to those questions. Amen. That he is sovereign, that his word is final. Amen. And he makes these points clear because Jesus is trying to reorient the people of God. He's trying to drag their attention away from religion and back towards restoration. Amen. He gets angry when the Pharisees don't answer his question. He's angry, some texts say, at the hardness of their hearts, their inability to change their perspective, their unwillingness to be challenged and to grow. <clears throat> Jesus is angry and sorrowful because he sees that the religion of the Israelites has become warped and paralyzed like the man's hand. It has become incapable of doing the work that it was intended to do to be a light to the nation, showing them Yahweh. It has filled the temple with so many rules and traditions that there is no longer any room to fall on your knees before the altar. 
It has added so many requirements and prerequisites to the covenant. It has become about relationship with God and. Salvation comes through God and. God and perfect obedience. God and scholarship. God and synagogue attendance. God and power. God and wealth. So the man steps forward to stand among them with his limp hand as a metaphor for the Pharisees' way of life. Withered and thin and useless. He stands as a testimony that this holy place is no longer a place of restoration. It's only a place of religion. And this is a warning, church. Sure, it is a healing story, but more so than that, it is a description of who we are not meant to be. It is a warning to remind us to make sure that our religion does not get in the way of Jesus' mission of restoration. We have to realize that throughout his ministry, Jesus' primary antagonist are religious people. We're meant to relate with the Pharisees and then move in the opposite direction. They are a mirror held up to us. Can we be honest about how uncanny the resemblance is? The story is a reminder that the church is a space where the sick are meant to come and find healing, where the lost find purpose, where the brokenhearted find comfort, where the lonely find family, where the marginalized find acceptance, where the poor find refuge. This worship today and this sermon are such tiny, tiny aspects of our calling. They're meant to be small reminders and small encouragements to keep us focused on the larger and more important work of restoration that we are meant for, that the church was formed for. The religion is meant to support the restoration, not replace it. Not lull us into a sense of holiness and satisfaction and accomplishment while there are still paralyzed hands in our community. James tells us pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. We do not do that work in this room on Sunday mornings. It happens in the other 167 hours of the week. Karl Marx called religion the opium of the masses, and the scene in Mark 3 is what he means. The Pharisees are satisfied with themselves. They are in the synagogue on Sabbath as they should be, resting as they should be. But that religious observance is not, it cannot be, the end goal. The end goal must be the restoration of the paralyzed hand. It must be the good. It must be life. Sabbath is meant to support the pursuit of those things, not supplant it. Religion, communal worship, local church is meant to be epicenters of restoration and redemption and reconciliation. Not an hour a week to make us feel good about ourselves and quiet our consciences. So, this story seems to emphasize two different aspects of Jesus' character. His role as our friend and his role as our priestly king. He both adores us, seeking to build a connection, and corrects us, seeking to reorient our lives. And the point that I want to emphasize is that these are not contradictory goals. That his correction is his love in action. That freeing us from the traps of man-made religion and and a sin-warped concept of what it means to be human. That he draws near to us and demonstrates his love over and over again by healing and protecting and feeding and freeing. But he also draws near to us, demonstrating his love over and over again by speaking out against the ways that we have misunderstood him and ourselves and the covenant between us. May we see the endless love in his anger as he corrects the Pharisees. May that enable us to be honest about how that correction and that love is meant for us as well. May our friendship with him enable us to hear him more clearly. So with all that being said, this is my prayer that I hope that you can join me in. May we as a community be a source of restoration. May we clear the fog created by political partisanship, by the culture war, by our fear, by our need for security, and see the withered hands in our communities. May we remove tradition and tribalism from the thrones that we've built for them. May we untangle power from our concept of the religion that was begun with a baby and a feeding trough. May we become comfortable with the Jesus that enforces his authority in our lives, his authority over our worldview, our decisions, our time. May Jesus be a threat. May Jesus be a threat to our sin-warped concepts of faith. May Jesus be a threat to our doctrine. May Jesus be a threat to our self-centeredness. May Jesus be a threat to our contentedness. May Jesus be a threat to our cowardice. May we have the humility to see that we are among the sick, that our hands are withered too. And refuse to look down on others who are struggling. May our doors never close on those who need to meet Jesus. 
May our evangelism be grounded in relationship, not condemnation. In this place, may we invite Jesus to form us into a new humanity. And may our time together each week fuel our fire for his work, not satiate it. May it be an impetus and a catalyst for the vital work of redemption that this world starves for.